Hi, everybody. W welcome to the 16th uh, episode of the Labiotech Hangout. This month, we have the, the co-founder of Peptomic here. Hi, Laura. Hi. Uh, so so Peptomic is, is, a, is a cool biotech startup based in, in, in Barcelona. You're developing a new generation of peptides for cancer treatments, and you were founded back in December 2014, and you raised a little over 5 million euros in private funding and some public funding on the side. And I think what's, what's the most interesting about your story is you really do like typical case of someone who made a discovery in the lab and then tries to translate it into like bringing it to patients and into a company. So first, can you just tell me a bit more on your story? And I'm really curious then to hear like on why and what's the upside, what's the downside? The first start was your story, how you get to peptomaking. I'll be happy to. So, um, Peptomic is the result of uh, more than 20 years of research, actually. Um, uh, our laboratory works uh, on cancer and on MIC inhibition. So, the basics. <laughs> um, our goal uh, as cancer researchers is to provide cancer patients with a new cure, more effective than the current ones, but also less toxic than the current ones. We see too many patients that decide not to undergo uh, therapy because of fear of the side effects that very often uh, come with the current therapies. And uh, when I was a student, more than 20 years ago, actually, um, I came across this protein, MYC. It's written M-Y-C. It's a protein that is present in all cells, both cancer cells and normal cells. But it is very clear that the cancer cells really depend on it. Um, MIC is what allows cancer cells to proliferate, to survive treatments, for example, or to even be invisible to our immune system. So you can imagine that uh, inhibiting MIC will give us a huge therapeutic opportunity in cancer. However, when I started working on this and I proposed to inhibit MIC, they told me that it was absolutely impossible. To date, still, MIC is considered an undruggable uh, target. Uh, it's undruggable for several reasons. It's a protein uh, with a very poor structure, three-dimensional structure. To, so designing inhibitors against it can be tricky. The other reason is that it's hidden inside the nuclei, a compartment that very often is considered impenetrable to drugs. And last but not least, uh, as I said at the beginning, it's shared also by normal cells. Yeah. So it was thought that inhibiting it would cause catastrophic side effects in normal tissues as well. But this was actually a dogma in the field. Nobody had really tried to inhibit MIC because of fear of these side effects. So uh, as a very naive student or stubborn student, uh, I don't know how to define myself at that point, I decided to try to, uh, to design a MIC inhibitor. And um, I started with this uh, OMOMIC, this protein that basically gives uh, um, MIC the perfect pair. It's something that uh, forms uh, dimers, uh, couples mm -hmm. with MIC and inactivates it. So um, I started using it uh, in uh, cells and immediately I saw that uh, cancer cells died while normal cells were simply a little piece lower, but they per were perfectly fine. So I had this first indication that I was on the right track. However, um, I was told that if I really wanted to show that there were no side effects using a MIC inhibitor, I had to use animals. And that was a big crisis in my life because uh, I was an when, animal. When, when was that exactly? Well, it was after my thesis. So I was around uh, in 2000 at that point, yeah. uh, in 2000. And they told me again that um, I had to work with animals to show something uh, regarding that. And as I was saying, I was an animalist. I didn't want to do experiments on animals. But I realized that if I believed my results, I had to be confident that I would have an impact on cancer cells without damaging normal ones, right? Mm -hmm. So I packed my bags. Uh, at that point, I was in Italy. I packed my bags and I went to the States uh, with one of these fellowships that is supposed to last one year. 
and you know how life is, right? <laughs> I stayed 10 years over there. Um, so, <laughs> yeah, so I stayed in San Francisco for 10 years and I had the chance to work for the first time with uh, mice that develop cancer and to use my inhibitor in them. Uh, and it was stunning. The result was really incredible. We would uh, cause shrinkage of the tumors without any damage for normal tissues. It was just uh, mind blowing. Uh, actually, I expected the, the cancer cells to stop only not to die or uh, cause uh, tumor shrinkage. So that result was really, really unexpected and it made me so happy. I remember walking around, you know, just with a smile from here to here all the time. But when I started presenting those data, I realized that the, the skepticism was still very, very present in yeah. the field. Uh, they told me that- uh, It was still only animal data. Uh, yeah, um, they told me that I was working at that point since, sorry, I couldn't hear you. I said it was still only animal data. I mean, it's exactly. much better than cells, but it's still early data. It was mouse, no? Yeah. Uh, so they told me, look, you're working with a system that is still too easy. Uh, mouse tumors uh, are very simple compared to human tumors. So if you want to show that what you're saying is true, uh, you have to work with human tumors. So packed my bags again. <laughs> I came back to Europe and I chose uh, here the Valdebron Institute of Oncology because I had the chance to use uh, patient samples. So tumors that came from the patients inside the hospital that can be implanted uh, in uh, mice, mice that do not have uh, uh, an intact immune system so they cannot reject human tumors and they grow the tumors uh, like in a pocket on their flank. Yeah. Um, so these mice do not really suffer uh, because of the growth of tumors uh, uh, much because uh, again, this tumor, they, they work as incubators for this tumor under their skin. Yeah, yeah. But it allows you to test in vivo, so in animals, um, your potential therapy in a context of human tumors. It's the best approximation that we have these mice are often called avatars, you know, uh, uh, of uh, human patients. And I was able to show that the same therapeutic effect was conserved even in human tumors. Uh, at that point, I really, really wanted uh, this omomic to become a drug. Why am I saying that? Because uh, in all these studies, I used omomic as gene therapy. I modified the genome of the mice to express omomic, or I inserted a, um, a foreign gene inside the cells. Mm. But this is something that we cannot do with patients yet. We cannot mm. modify them genetically. Uh, so I really needed something different. And uh, this was again uh, a big challenge because when I started talking about making omomic into a drug, people told me once again that it was impossible, that omomic was too big and bulky to ever be used as a drug. It's a protein of 90 amino acids. Mm -hmm. And so they told me this drug will never penetrate cells efficiently, not even to mention getting to the nuclei of the cells, right? Yeah. So... Uh, Again, I thought, okay, you're back telling me this. You, but, <laughs> but you, you didn't pack your bags. No, no, no. I'm still here in Barcelona, actually. <laughs> and um, at that point, I had this fantastic encounter with my colleague, uh, Marie F. Bolio, uh, that started as a postdoc in my lab. She was an expert uh, in uh, peptide design and production. And instead of producing omomic as a gene, she started producing it as a mini protein, purified mini protein. Uh, and uh, we thought, okay, we can try to modify it so that we can make it penetrate cells. But we didn't have to do it. Sometimes luck is on your side, right? So when we used it as it was without any modification on cells, we, th we saw that it was a fantastic cell penetrating peptide. It was able to cross the cell membrane, not only get to the nuclei, so cross also the nuclear membrane and arrive inside the nuclear where it would attack me and uh, do its job. So fantastic news. Uh, this was something that we found out uh, in uh, 2013. Okay. And we filed immediately a patent to protect the use of these cell-penetrating peptides based on omomic. 
And from there, we decided that it was time to create a company because, the, because we realized that the fastest way to translate what we have been doing in the lab into something meaningful for patients was through a spin-off company. So um, basically, we got the support of uh, our institutions, uh, which were the Valdebron Institute of Oncology and ICREA, the Catalan Institute of Research and Advanced Studies here in Barcelona. So we, we created the company. Uh, December. I mean, it, it, it's crazy because it's. I mean, first it, it shows that how long the journey is. Mm -hmm. And my second thing is, is why did you decided to start it instead of like remaining in your lab and having like you know someone you know running the project or something like as it can be done. Right? So the skepticism is not finished yet. Finding somebody that uh, uh, believes as strongly in this project as we do was not trivial. Mm -hmm. Also, uh, as you pointed out, this is a research that has been led for 20 years, so nobody knows our product better than us. We have really characterized this uh, uh, very, very thoroughly. Uh, very often, drugs get into clinical trials without knowing much about their mechanism of action, while yeah. we know a lot about this protein. Um, and Mariev, uh, in the last couple of years, has characterized it uh, from a different point of view, you know, a biophysical uh, uh, and biochemical uh, point of view as well. So we now have a very well known product. And as I was saying, nobody knows it better than us. Um, and uh, I still believe that it's much easier for a scientist to learn about business than the other way around, you know, an expert in business to learn about science. So I thought that, yes, I was stepping out of my comfort zone, clearly. <laughs> but uh, um, at the same time, I knew that I could. At the beginning, you, you feel a little bit, uh, you know, in uh, enemy territory. Yeah. There is also this uh, preconceived notion by pure scientists that you're going to the dark side, uh, going into... Pure, pure scientists, yeah. Um, <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> uh, and um, so um, I, you know, I, I, I knew that I was making a big change. Uh, on the other hand, uh, I was lucky enough because I was able to keep both hats. So I still direct both my research lab and I... Uh, direct the company at the same time. The interests of both are aligned at the moment. In the future, we will have to see whether I have to make a decision between the two. But um, at the moment, uh, um, I think it's the best for the company. Uh, how, do, how, do you how do you have time to do both? Good question. So uh, you mentioned... <laughs> and you talk to me? <laughs> Well, that, that, that is going to cost you a lot. But anyway, um, no, I was just uh, saying that uh, um, you you have to consider that my hours of sleep uh, have um, gone down significantly. <laughs> um, I guess that what is uh, motivating me is still the enthusiasm for this. So, uh, actually, it, the enthusiasm is growing with time. Uh, uh, I feel that we are closer and closer to the clinic. Just to give you an idea where we are now, we are doing the industrial production of the peptide. And if everything goes well, in 2020, we will treat the first patients. So 20 years later, actually more than 20 years later, from my first design of this thing in, as a university student, finally, I will see whether this works in, uh, in patients. Uh, and as you can imagine, that's it's terrifying. A, it's <laughs> an amazing feeling, like really seeing your own work and drug and actually going to, to a patient who's name. Really yeah, amazing. you know, at the, at the end, it's the ultimate objective of a cancer research, right? Mm. To, to, to be able to do something like that. Um, the, the most meaningful changes in the cancer treatment have come from discoveries made by basic scientists. Yeah. And uh, I have the luck and the privilege to have been able to follow this project all the way. So I really hope to see it giving uh, its results in clinical trials. Um, yeah. And um, no, that's, that's, that's really cool. On Mick, let, let me challenge you a bit on Mick as well. Like, yeah. as, as, but I guess you have, you have good answers. But um, all this like intracellular targets, I mean, I hear a pitch every month on someone telling me like, oh yeah, we have, we have the, un we are targeting the undraggable and we have the platform that will reach undraggable. 
And so far, I've never seen something work. So um, why should you yours like work? I mean, besides the early results you said, but like what, what's what's really specific about it? Well, uh, we have been peer reviewed uh, more than once. Uh, so what I'm talking about is. Uh, is things that I can show you published and peer reviewed and validated. Um, so the last publication in science translation on medicine, for example, was the proof of concept, the uh, proof of principle of uh, the therapeutic impact of the peptide in vivo in mice carrying non-small cell lung cancer. Um, so we have shown that uh, this uh, polypeptide can be administered intravenously and reach its target and have a therapeutic impact with a complete safe profile. So what I had seen with the transgene, the complete safety and lack of uh, side effects is yeah. conserved also in the case of the polypeptide. Again, they had, you know, 20 years of research might seem like a very slow process, but at the same time, uh, give much more confidence uh, in uh, our product. Yeah. Okay. So basically you've done all the work you can, but now it's still like, will it work in humans? And you still have 90% chance of failing in humans. Uh, yeah. Yeah, there is still quite a significant difference between mice and humans. Yes. <laughs> I'm very good at curing uh, mice so far. Yeah. yeah. And, um, and can you tell a bit more like on the clinical trial? I mean, I guess it will be a, a phase one or phase one B. Uh, what? So it will be uh, phase one, two. One, so two. We, we want to show first safety uh, in a phase one, but or efficacy in a phase two. Um, in principle, the beauty of uh, attacking MIC is that in principle, we could go into all types of cancers. Um, it's the opposite of personalized medicine. We don't have to look for tumors that have a MIC mutation. MIC is an essential node through which all sorts of mutation funnel. So um, we are not designing this therapy for 1% of 2% mm. of the cancer population. We are really, we have the potential to apply this approach to so many different types of cancer, potentially all of them. Uh, for are you not afraid, I mean, are you not afraid in that case that you are, by being less specific and less personalized that the efficacy will be lower? Not at all, uh, in the sense that our preclinical data show that you have efficacy in uh, the presence of all different uh, putational profiles. It's uh, more of a practical selection that we will have to do in this case. We cannot uh, um, start with all types of cancer. We will have to make uh, you know, some decisions. At the moment, uh, we think that the expansion will be done uh, at least in two indications, uh, metastatic advanced breast cancer mm. and uh, non-small cell lung cancer. Um, so Why is that an unmet medical need? Or? Absolutely, based on that. Uh, first, uh, it's also these two types of cancer are the, the ones with the highest uh, killing rate yeah. at the moment um, and also because uh, um, we we want to offer an option to to types of cancer that at the moment are failing other types of treatments uh, first you know yeah makes sense and on maybe if we can just on, on the on the science of the clinic like go a bit like take a bit of perspective on the peptide field because peptides i'm yeah i mean Sounds to me sounds almost always like something from a bit more from the past, um, and when I compare it to monoclonal antibody checkpoint inhibitors, now I mean CAR T or cell therapy, which I mean are super high tech but also like super efficient, and like so, are really peptides like I mean I get the, the benefits of like it's cheap to produce and I, in the ideal world it would work, but do you really think like it could work as well as a, as a CAR -T, let's say CAR T or checkpoint inhibitor? Uh, it's it's a fantastic question that you're asking because it gives me the the opportunity to elaborate a little bit more on the features of our peptides. So when you think of peptides, you're probably referring to past failure of uh, peptides that got to the clinic. Uh, um, we are not working with small peptides, um, uh, we are working with mini proteins. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, our domains are really big. They have a very, very defined three-dimensional structure. Um, they have a very, very good half-life. 
many of the short peptides that you were mentioning before have a very poor bioavailability or a half-life in the bloodstream of 20 minutes. We are talking about uh, um, half-life in the bloodstream of more than two days in the case of our peptides. Uh, they are really, really sturdy peptides, very thermostable, uh, very good uh, uh, to be used systemically. Uh, so that's definitely a difference. The other thing, uh, compared to small molecules approach, uh, uh, approaches that really, you know, used against MIC before, um, uh, with an intrinsically disordered protein such as MIC, uh, with a small molecule, uh, you don't have a sufficient interaction surface uh, with something like that. Uh, so usually if you have a small molecule that works against an intrinsically disordered protein such as MIC, it also interacts with a lot of other proteins, giving tons of side effects. With a bigger interaction surface like ours, like, like the polypeptide surface, uh, you instead get uh, higher specificity for the, for the target, oh. so no side effects, and uh, very, very good and stable interaction with the target. Less, less side effects. Less side effects. No, yes. no side effects would be nice. Well, I was saying polypeptide like ours. I'm not saying it, ours has no side effects, uh, but uh, I, I'm just saying that it's a, an approach that I believe can yeah. be expanded to other targets as well, to other undruggable targets. Many of the undruggable targets that you were mentioning before have this in common: this intrinsically disordered structure. Uh, you know, uh, nature. Okay. So maybe this approach, the same approach that we are using for MIC, can be expanded to other targets as well. And who, who else is, is using that like polypeptide approach to, to target intracellular uh, targets? Um, there are a lot of people that are now using uh, peptides, uh, not necessarily as big as ours. Uh, at the moment, I think that there are 250 peptides uh, in development, uh, and I think more than 70 therapeutic peptides uh, have been approved so far. So peptides, uh, it's true that they arrive to clinical trials much later than small molecules, but are slowly gaining, uh, you know, um, weight. Uh, and uh, um, so th there are several uh, companies, not only in oncology. In oncology, the peptides are still struggling. Uh, mm -hmm. We hope to make a difference there. Hope so too. <laughs> uh, I guess clinical data will, will tell. Yeah. Um, that sounds, sounds really good. And maybe switching gears a bit like towards like, more management. I mean, when we, we met at, at, uh, at, the, at the dinner in, in Barcelona and we, we had a chat about this actually and how, the struggle of like managing the team or like switching from research to, to management or business. So how, how did you actually manage to do that transition and what were the, the challenges? Well, I, I wasn't alone in this uh, challenge again. Uh, Marie F, uh, uh, I told you started as a postdoc in my lab, but she switched 100% to the company and started uh, leading it as chief scientific officer. So she really complemented uh, my work. Um, and uh, we uh, selected a team, uh, not only a scientific team, but a team made of experts in uh, strategy, business, uh, you know, intellectual property that uh, really helped us to cover and uh, uh, complement uh, our abilities and fill the gaps where we had weaknesses. Uh, yeah. I think that the first thing that you have to realize is your limitations, uh, because that's the first uh, step to improvement. And uh, admitting your limitations helps you to, to choose the right people to help you um, with those. Right? I mean, you're talking really about also, I mean, limitation from a company point of view, a team point of view, but what were your personal limitations and what, did you, limitations what did you have to work on? I mean, your, yourself, what did you, what were your limitations? What did you have to work on? Well, I had no business experience at all, for example, zero. Uh, so uh, the first thing that I did was to find somebody that could help me. And that case was Joseph Pius Falco that started uh, advising me while uh, I was attending classes, uh, you know, business classes at night. 
uh, mm. again, where you find the hours to do those things <laughs> when you're a scientist, um, or, uh, you know, reading as much as possible, making mistakes, uh, asking stupid questions, so all those things, I've done them. Uh, and um, uh, that's that's where you start. You, you know, when I said stepping out of your comfort zone, I met it. I meant it in in many different aspects. I, I like that. I like that a lot. I, think it's, I mean, that that makes such a big difference. I mean, you, it's such a proof of resilience and such a proof of motivation that makes a difference. I mean, it makes a difference for everything. For like absolutely. Some, somebody calls it masochism. Yeah. I just want to warn you. <laughs> I personally can be not that pleasant, but. It, it's really a sacrifice that, that builds you and makes you learn and you can trans, transmit it or express it then to your team, express it to investors, which brings you to, me, to my last question on how, how was it to, to, raise, to raise money? I, I, like, how was it to, to, to raise money and how easy was it? Um, the beginning was uh, really shocking because I, you know, the, the form of giving a pitch for me was so counterintuitive. As a scientist, uh, the measure of success is how long your speech is. Uh, you usually hope to, oh, to be given slide, right? more and more time to talk. So you start as a student giving 10 minute uh, talks. And then when you get to one hour talk, you really have grown in your career. And then you go back to being an entrepreneur. You have to pitch for maximum three minutes or the elevator pitch that is even less. And you have to be able to convey your message in such a short time. Not only, you have to be careful not to be too scientific because that burns the investors to death. Uh, <laughs> so I, you know, my strength was the science, uh, the science and I couldn't talk about it too much. Um, so I had to learn how to evaluate my project, not only from uh, the impact that that could have in the clinical practice, but also on the value, economical value of that project. And um, market studies, all these kind of, uh, you know, different business models, it was something that I had to learn uh, uh, bit by bit. But it worked, worked quite well. I mean, you raised 4.2 4 million from, from Alta in, what, in September last year. And oh. the equity, yeah, in, uh, in 2017. Oh, 2017, sorry. Yeah. 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 So it was, I mean, it's, it's a pretty nice round. Uh, Especially, I mean, especially, I mean, especially in Spain, actually, it's really nice round for a seed. It's yeah. really good. So we we were very lucky. We did the first seed round with Business Angels and Health Equity in 2016, and then in 2017 we were able to do uh, this major series that you're talking about, in which we had Health Equity and Business Angels. This time led by Alta Life Sciences. Alta Life Sciences is this uh, wonderful uh, uh, new fund here in Europe. Uh, we were the their first investment in Europe. So we are very proud of that too. That's, that's good. Um, that's, that's great. So I think we're running out of time. I would love to talk 20 more minutes and, uh, and <laughs> ask you way more questions. Um, I think come back have every question. Yeah, I will, I will come back. I will come back. Uh, I love my time there. I think the, usually I ask you the next steps, but I guess your focus is really preparing the human clinical trials. That's your biggest focus. Or do you have an, another fundraising coming soon? Well, definitely the clinical trials are very expensive. Uh, so uh, we made the calculation that we need at least two, two, for the phase one, two clinical trials, we need 10 million euros. So the fundraising has already started and uh, okay. we expect uh, the, uh, round to happen at the end of this year or at the latest, the beginning of next year. Okay, that's good. So if some investors are, are, are looking or watching watching that, they can, they can contact you. Um, and I'm sure some will. Um, <laughs> and my last question, I always finish with that one, is who, who should we interview next? For a young, young biotech entrepreneur somewhere in Europe doing something cool and is with a good personality. So the dinners that you guys organize are really good to meet very cool people. And I uh, met this very talented uh, um, uh, scientist entrepre entrepreneur, Judith Cubedo hmm. from Glycardial. I'm sure that uh, she would be a good person to interview. Sounds good. Yeah, and actually she was, she was at the dinner. So. Um, okay, cool, I will, I will invite her. 
um yeah thanks thanks a lot Laura. Well, it was really great to chat and um good luck with everything get I keep you posted. <laughs> still get some sleep it's important <laughs> yes thank you thank and you very much. thank you bye-bye thank you